In the last few episodes of the series, we talked about the radiation of eutheriid mammals that began just prior to the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction and only accelerated after that. Almost everything in that list that we discussed so far were hooved animals, meridiungulates and mesonychids, desmostylians and dinosaurotans, tethotheres and perizodactyls, among other things. Many more varieties have come and gone than we have left anymore. But now we're going to talk about the evolution of carnivorans, the hunter-killers who, unlike us, have to fight or die. The word carnivore means meat-eater, but there are many more meat-eating animals that are not carnivorans, meaning that they're not members of the order carnivora, which is a specific subset of boreo-eutherian mammals, just as we are. But just as we are eucontigliers, leading to archontids, they are laurasiotherians, leading to scrotifarians. You see, as with all other mammalian groups, we started with a base template that would have looked like a shrew, being the most basal form and the most generalized. From there, different groups of descendants developed their own specialities. You can remain a jack-of-all-trades like modern shrews still are, but you'll have to give up some of your range of barely adequate versatility if you're going to excel beyond your competitors at the one skill that could be your best aptitude. True shrews are still the tiniest and most lightweight mammals alive today. The safest place for them to be is in the undergrowth or in the trees. So it's easy to see why there is a morphological and genetic link connecting them to bats. Despite that one obvious feature of those wings, bats and shrews are not really that much different. But it was just the one lineage that developed the elastic skin with which those modified insectivores could glide and eventually fly and then branch into hundreds and hundreds of species of microbats and megabats. That other lineage that didn't develop wings stayed on the ground, foraging however they could. After the dinosaurs were eliminated, these other animals were able to get much bigger because there wasn't much left that was bigger than them anymore. And here we come to a fork in the road, but with an interesting overlap and two options, whether to develop hooves like the ungulates or keep their claws like ferae. We know that having claws doesn't make you a meat eater and having hooves doesn't make you a plant eater either. Now, rodents have claws, and pigs have hooves, and both might eat meat on rare occasions, but mesonychids were full-on hunter-predators with hooves. And that must have been inconvenient, which is probably why there are no mesonychids left at, um, at all anymore. There's an obvious advantage in being able to catch something and hold on to it before you bite it. Though not everything in this category was a hunter. Quite a few taxonomists were surprised when genomic sequencing showed that toothless and scaly pangolins belonged alongside creodonts and carnivores. The earliest pangolin was a fossil species in Germany from 47 million years ago, so you can see how long ago this division must have occurred. And pangolins have powerful claws for digging because they only eat ants. They don't have any teeth, which is why it's surprising to see them so closely connected to carnivorans. Pangolins also have dermal scales. Imagine the scoots on a rat's tail, which are like the last remnant of scales that mammals still have, except that in pangolins, that gene got switched back on after modification. Thus, they grow over the whole animal, but they're now very different than reptilian scales. So it doesn't matter that a different mutation cost them their teeth because they didn't need them anymore, neither for hunting nor for defense. And creodonts are something you've probably never heard of. They were a sort of prototype of carnivorans, like the basic idea of predatory mammals, but only a rough draft that wasn't as well developed. Most were the size of dogs. A couple got to be as big as wolves or even lions. The most famous creodonts were hyenodonts, a genus of several species that managed to survive for 25 million years before dying out roughly 11 million years ago. Hyenodont could be as big as a large wolf, but it couldn't run anywhere near as fast as a wolf, nor as far. It wasn't as smart as a wolf either, having a much smaller brain, so it probably wasn't very social like wolves. About all it did have was a stunning bite force. Imagine a wolf whose canines could stab with the force of a lion's fangs, but those self-sharpening carnassals, the shearing teeth at the back, had three times that much bite force, able to snip off limbs like a giant pair of scissors. Early carnivorans were not that impressive. We can see that in some of the intermediate species we still have, such as the genet. Genets are one of several species of viverids, which are among the most primitive members of Phylloidea, the cat side of the carnivoran family tree. Of course, there's a lot more there than just cats. There's meerkats and bearcats and things that are quite cat-like, but not quite cats. Remember that evolution is a matter of incremental, superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities. Distinctions usually appear in the surface features first, 
and then in the skeleton later on. So the further two species grow apart through accumulation of mutations and genetic drift, the deeper their differences divide them. For example, just as shrews are karyotypic of the earliest eutherians being the most basal shape for all mammals, genets are karyotypic of the particular modification that is the crown or dawn of the order carnivora. This began with a now extinct group called myocids that look very much like genets, at least skeletally. Initially, the difference between what would become cats and what would become dogs was no more distinct than comparing these two kits. One launched conoidia, the dog side, branching into procyonids, which means before dogs. And these include raccoons, kinkajous, and coatis. Another similar branch includes the red panda. Now, these are all superficially dog-like or proto-dogs, but they still have functioning hands because they're primarily arboreal, living in the trees. Another branch were ground-wandering weasels whose hands became feet and they lost the ability to manipulate things with their fingers. These include otters, which are another karyotype for the initially otter-like pinnipeds, which became increasingly specialized swimmers, leading to sea lions and eventually seals and walruses. The largest of the weasel family are wolverines, which are another illustrative karyotype of some now extinct forms representing another important transition. Wolverines look a bit like dogs, except that they walk on their whole foot, like plantigrade, like bears. Or they look like little bears, except that they still have long tails. We find things like this in the fossil record, too. Some of them much, much bigger. Now, we've got fossils of both bear dogs and dog bears. Amphocyon, for example, was such a big bear dog that it didn't need to worry much about creodonts like hyenodon. Then there was another branch of these undifferentiated dog bears that lost their tails, becoming actual bears, of course. And while their sister set began running on their toes, digigrade, and this provided an extra spring in their step that made it easier to run much more efficiently, especially when they retracted that completely useless thumb toe, which is now just a vestigial dew claw. Some canids could run far, almost indefinitely, and fast, really fast. This slight adaptation for running on four toes is what turned an already capable killer, similar to a wolverine, into an inescapable, high-speed, long-distance super predator. And some of them were impressive indeed. This lineage produced foxes and weasel-like quasi-dogs and huge killer dogs bigger than me called barophagines or bone crushers because they had massive carnassal teeth that could shear through anything, like the jaws of life, except you know, of death. Then there were many different species of true dogs, modern canids like wolves and jackals and African cape dogs employing higher intelligence for coordinated attack strategies, such that it's no wonder that every other contemporary predator failed to compete on or escape from the same open field. Terrifying, really. Understand that only domestic dogs are derived from wolves, and apart from wolves, there are several different species of wild dogs that were never wolves and are now too genetically distinct to breed with domestic dogs. Then on the cat side of the carnivore family tree, that other kit branched into vivrids. These include civet cats, which were cute enough until the civets got bigger and became like 50 different species of hideous hyenas, of which only four species still exist. Then there was another now extinct group called Nimravids, which were not yet cats. Very close though. There was only a slight difference in the inner ear that separates them from being true cats, so they were almost cats. Although, if you were being hunted by a barber felis, you'd better treat it like it's a genuine tiger. This isn't a saber-toothed tiger though. That's something else. All the cats we have today belong in one of two sets. They're all either panthers or felines. Cougars and cheetahs are both felines, just like your house cat, except, you know, bigger. But there was once a third group of cats in the fossil record called Macarodontinae, or scimitar cats. They could be any size, but they were the ones with scimitar or saber teeth. The biggest of these cats was Smilodon fatalis, but it was not the only one. There were plenty of other scimitar cats once upon a time. Interestingly, it seems the saber teeth of Barbarophilus and Smilodon were not directly related. They apparently evolved this way independently. In fact, the same thing happened with an Australian predator named Thylaca smilus, which is a marsupial, completely outside of all the families we've mentioned so far today. But of course, we've seen a few times when canine teeth grew to ridiculous lengths, and sometimes when they didn't even seem to serve any purpose at all. 
So now you know about the evolution of carnivorans, and we can get back to our own lineage. Remember that Carolus Linnaeus, the guy who invented the systematic classification of life, initially conceived of seven ranks into which he imagined all organisms could be equally categorized. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Then a few decades ago, they invented a new, an eighth taxonomic rank for domains because they realized that seven ranks were not enough. To give you an idea how far off the mark that is, we're 42 episodes into this series and we've covered 67 named clades so far. Remember that as we've gone through the series, episode two talked about our domain. Then we squeezed the next seven clades into episode three just to get to our kingdom. We didn't get to our phylum until episode seven and we were a couple dozen episodes in before we got to our class. And it was episode 37 that finally got us to our taxonomic order. To recap from there, we talked about the fact that we are primates. What kind of primates? Dry-nosed primates or haplorines. What kind of haplorines? Simiaforms or anthropoids, more commonly known as monkeys. What kind of monkeys? Old world monkeys or caterines. What kind of caterines? Hominoids, otherwise known as apes. What kind of apes? Well, that gets us to our taxonomic family. The superfamily Hominoidea is divided into two taxonomic families based primarily on size. Lesser apes, Hylobatidae, and the great apes of the family Hominidae. Every member of the family of large apes is known as a hominid, though it wasn't always that way. When Linnaeus said that he couldn't tell humans and apes apart by comparing our physical features, he challenged the scientific community of his day to account for that. And the way that they did was to make up an artificial classification. The genus Pongo was arbitrarily invented as a paraphyletic or everything but us category, meaning that every ape except for humans were placed in the genus Pongo just to create the illusion that we were somehow different groups. But then they started finding fossil apes, some of which smudged the illusory boundary between us, especially those fossil apes that were obviously crossing over that imaginary line into our category and threatening our pretense of unique distinction. So scientists already knew there was a definite taxonomic problem when a couple decades ago genomic sequence analyses revealed what a deliberate distortion that contrived 18th century sham really was and that centuries old mistake was finally corrected. Because it wasn't just fossils or morphology but our genetic paternity determines that we are a subset of apes in the same way that lions are cats and iguanas are lizards and ducks are a subset of birds. Some restructuring was necessary. And back then, those fossil apes that were more like us than any ape alive today were known as hominids. So it only made sense to include them and us in the same family and to recognize that we are hominids too. I tried to explain that to an elderly anthropology professor who was using antiquated terms on his test, why I was going to answer a question correctly according to the current understanding rather than the way he wanted me to. I wanted him to understand that I know what I'm talking about and that my answer would be justified. But he marked it wrong anyway on the excuse that he couldn't be bothered to keep track of all the updates anymore. It was the only wrong answer on my test, so it didn't matter. We still use the clade name Pongo, but it was elevated above the genus level to include orangutans and their extinct relatives. They are a subset of hominids called Pongids, and that's exactly what we're going to talk about now. According to molecular data, at this point in our evolution, we're into the early Miocene, 15 or 16 million years ago. Although the earliest of the great ape fossils found so far are from roughly 12 million years ago and discovered in Asia rather than Africa. The associated species of Ramapithecus and Sivapithecus were more similar to lesser apes, gibbons and siamangs, than they were to chimpanzees or gorillas which again implies an evolutionary sequence, the kind of gradation that Linnaean taxonomy could have predicted. Looking at orangutans, it's easy to see traits of lesser apes being retained in a bigger version. And they did get big. In fact, the biggest ape known to science was a pongid called Gigantopithecus. And based on fragments of teeth and jaws, they were estimated to have been up to 12 feet tall and 1,200 pounds. There is no complete skeleton, so some proportions could be different. But even if it had shorter legs and arms, it's still substantially way bigger than any gorilla. Interestingly, even though we are not descended from Pongids, they developed in Asia as an offshoot of our own lineage which emerged in Africa, we're now talking about things that really look like people, even to other people. Remember that Linnaeus classified orangutans as a species of human. 
In the jungles of Borneo and Sumatra, where they still barely survive, orangutans are known to the local people as the old men of the forest, because that's what they look like. So if Gigantopithecus looked like orangutans, but at that enormous size, what would they have looked like to us? Especially if their arms weren't so long, because they obviously couldn't live in the trees anymore either. I mean, where does a 500 kilogram ape live? Anywhere he wants to. Imagine being able to grab a tiger by the tail and thrash it to death. Imagine being able to punch out an elephant. These giant old men of the forests lived until about 100,000 years ago, well overlapping the range of anatomically modern humans by a couple hundred thousand years. So just imagine what our ancestors would have thought of them if they'd ever met before they were apparently wiped out by climate change driven by an ice age. And speaking of our ancestors, our taxonomic family, hominidae, the great apes, aren't just large apes. There's more distinguishing features than just their size. For one thing, great apes are described as having less fur or more sparse hair than lesser apes or monkeys. Although all the other apes appear to be hairier than we are, we actually have the same number of hair follicles all over our bodies. The difference being in how much of that hair grows out long and thick. Apes also have an unprecedented brain size to body mass of any animal on Earth. And consequently, they also have the most complex socio-emotional relationships of any other social mammal. All apes also share our dentition of two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars in each quarter of our mouth. In some species, the canine is reduced to an almost useless vestige of our former fangs. And the molars have a shape that is diagnostic of apes, because every ape has them, and only apes have this, where each molar comes to five points interrupted by a Y-shaped crevice. It's a very particular configuration and hard to explain. So if you want to know exactly what ape molars look like, go to a mirror and open your mouth real wide. <laughs>